welcome to DFN on FATV. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. This week's show is on ranked choice voting. This is a way of voting that allows the voter to rank multiple candidates in order of preference, first choice, second choice, third choice, as opposed to our current voting system where the one with the most votes wins, even if they did not receive a majority of the vote. Joining us are guests Nathan Lockwood and Jim Henderson, representing Voter Choice MA, a nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit organization advocating for the adoption of ranked choice voting in Massachusetts. They state RCV would make Massachusetts elections more competitive and fair by encouraging the participation of more candidates and parties and by ensuring outcomes that more accurately reflect the will of the voters. Our co-host for the evening is Kelly Wilbur, a local business owner and contributor and guest to our sister political show, Fitchburg Lemonster All Politics. Welcome, everybody. Thank Glad you. to be here, Sam. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having us. Nathan, Nathan Lockwood, Jim Henderson. Yes. Yes. And Kelly Wilbur. All right. So, ranked choice voting. Let's get started on, on your, why don't you introduce the topic? Well, so let me, here's how I want to start off this. Um, Ranked choice voting is one of the, the many uh, issues about elections and voting that we have around the country. Uh, we've uh, been, a lot of people have heard about gerrymandering. It's been in the news a lot these days. We've had, there's a, a major Supreme Court case in play right now in Washington. Uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court just overturned their entire uh, congressional district map because of uh, overt uh, partisan gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And so people have heard about the, the issues about gerrymandering, where essentially you have uh, elected officials picking their voters in order to make sure they, they stay. Well, determining uh, in, the district lines to pick it, it, which voters. It, exactly. Uh, but so people have been heard about that. But ranked choice voting plays a lot of, along the same lines as gerrymandering. It's not the pick your voters, but it's a essentially pick the, uh, essentially limit the uh, number of people who can actually uh, be presented before the voters. Mm -hmm. And so one of the benefits of ranked choice voting, and we'll get to this in more detail as we go along, is that it allows more people to run and allows the voters to um, support not just candidates of two parties, but they can express the preference for multiple parties. So perhaps what we should start, Nathan, is talk about, I mean, the problems we see in our existing first past the post election system. Sure. Oh, well, thanks, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. So let's queue up uh, slide number one, please. So uh, folks out there watching today, well, uh, many of them will no doubt remember the uh, 2000 presidential election oh, and yes. how it really kind of came down to the wire in the state of Florida. Winner of Florida wins the election. And uh, that race in Florida could not have been any closer than it, it was. I think uh, 537 votes out of close to six million voters mm -hmm. separated. Depending on what the, how they went with the hanging chads. Right. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. you got the hanging chads, absolutely. Uh, very memorable. Um, so you couldn't really s stage an election to be any closer than that. Mm -hmm. So in addition to uh, Bush and Gore, who each got about three million votes, there was Ralph Nader, who um, got about 100,000 votes, uh, way more than the In difference. Florida. In Florida, sorry, right. we're just talking about Florida here, yeah. Yep. So 100,000 in Florida, way more than the difference of 537. And if you'll queue up slide number two, please. Jim, you want to take it from there? Yeah, so as you'll see on this vote, uh, that there were, really was just this 537 vote difference between the top two candidates. Yet the 100,000 votes, roughly, that Ralph Nader had was clearly way more than the uh, than that difference, mm -hmm. and so the, the spoiler the, effect. The, well, that's a spoiler effect, and the question that really comes up, and people make a lot of assumptions about uh, who would the Ralph Nader voters have voted for. Right now, we uh, people say, well, of course they would have voted for Al Gore. Well, if you actually go to the the third slide we have here, slide three, you'll see that there's actually. Um, a quarter of the people who voted for Al Gore, uh, not for Al Gore, for Ralph Nader, actually preferred George Bush. Mm -hmm. But as we'll show up on, on slide three, uh, roughly 45% of the people who did in fact uh, support um, Ralph Nader would have chosen Gore as the second choice. And that difference, that 18% difference when looking at 100,000 votes. That would have tipped the scale for Gore. I mean, clearly mm -hmm. more than 537 votes. And so we have a pretty good idea in that race in Florida that the majority of the people in Florida would have preferred Al Gore to win. Mm -hmm. But in our first past the post system, uh, 
it was uh, George Bush who got the electoral votes that year. With less than 50% of the with vote. With less than 50% less than 50 of the vote, and, and we feel fairly demonstrably, less than majority support, that somebody else would have gotten more support in, in the state of Florida. According to the exit polls from According Ralph to the exit voters. polls, exactly right. And so this is a place where um, the will of the people was somewhat thwarted by the existing way that we vote for people. Again, I'll go back to the gerrymandering thing, that the will of the people can be thwarted by the gerrymandering districts that are the way we elect people. The first past the post system mm. can thwart the will of the people. And so this is the, the classic example of the spoiler effect. Yeah, and this wasn't a big surprise to people during the race. So during this race, even from the early beginning when Nader announced he was going to run, Nader was uh, kind of demonized, basically. Here was a, a guy who had been, you know, consumer advocate for years, a real positive figure in, you know, uh, our culture and our politics, was being, uh, you know, being absolutely criticized for running because they're like, what are you doing running for office? You're just going to throw the election to George Bush. You're going to hurt Al Gore, who's, you don't have any chance of win, winning. You're going to hurt Al Gore, who's pretty close to you politically and does have a chance of winning. So, uh, you know, uh, Nader was derided for running. Uh, is bad or worse, people who were thinking about, were excited that he was running and thinking about voting for him, they were being, you know, bullied as well. They were like, what are you, what are you thinking? You're going to waste your vote. You're going to throw your vote away on that Nader guy. He yeah. can never win. Instead, you have to go with the lesser of two evils. Exactly, right. yes. I, I, exactly. So that's one of the, that's that, the vote splitting issue, now the, 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 the spoiler issue that we see in our current system. Now, there's, I just mentioned the other phrase that I want to drop, uh, drop on is the idea of vote splitting. And so Ralph, uh, Al, uh, Ralph Nader only got a small percentage of the vote in that election. And so right, clearly he wasn't going to win. But there are some other circumstances where you have candidates um, who are of like mind who may have a chance to win, but for the fact that there's more than one candidate in that race. So if we can bring up uh, slide number four, I'm going to take everyone back to our uh, gubernatorial primary four years ago, where we had three top candidates for the Democratic nomination uh, here in Massachusetts. Now we're talking about a primary election. A primary election, but again, still an election. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had Martha Coakley, who was the one who eventually ran against our current governor, Charlie Baker. But there were two other candidates. We had Steve Grossman and Don Berwick, who a lot of people within the Democratic Party felt were more closely aligned politically, ideologically, than they were to Martha Coakley. Uh, but as you can see on this slide here, between Steve Grossman and, and Don Berwick, neither of them got more votes than Martha Coakley did. But if you had combined the two candidates, had, for instance, the people who supported Don Berwick had been, uh, say, oh, allowed to make a, a second choice for Steve Grossman, perhaps he would have won. He would have had the majority support within the Democratic Party and arguably might have had a better shot uh, in winning in the general election. But he instead, a majority of the voters, um, you know, 57% of the Democratic voters voted for someone besides exactly. the winning exactly. candidate. Yeah. E exactly yeah. right. And so this was uh, the issue that happened four years ago. Now, if we go to the next slide, we're gonna, we may see the exact same thing this year. We've got three pretty good candidates, uh, if you are a Democrat in, in this uh, state, and, and there, we, have, we have good Republican examples coming up too. But if you're a Democrat in the state, you can look at the three candidates uh, for governor this year and say, hey, they're all pretty good. Um, is, there, is it likely that one of these three gentlemen are gonna get 50% of the vote in the Democratic primary in September? Who knows? But it's entirely possible, looking at the example from four years ago, that someone might get a plurality, might get 40% of the vote, but might in fact not be the strongest candidate when it comes to the general election. So this brings up an interesting point that I always think of um, along with ranked choice voting, which is, is it only good for independents? Or this seems like an example of where it could actually benefit the two major parties in terms of selecting better candidates that would do better in a general election. Absolutely. I mean, so long as we're using a primary system, I mean, I, I think generally speaking, I'd like to think that all of us that sit around this table, and hopefully the people watching here, like the idea that if people want to run for office, we should encourage it. We should not be implementing a system where we tell people, no, don't run for office. That's a bad thing. You'd be the spoiler. You'd ruin it for our whole party. No, but, but it, yeah, exactly. right. But in generally speaking, if, I mean, I, I ran for office. You Obviously, you have too, Sam. If you 
have the guts to run for office, you should do so. You should be supported. And you should be supported in doing so. And we should allow the voters then to have the opportunity to say, hey, if I like Sam for city council or Jim for whatever office he's running, that whether or not I'm in a major party or whether or not I'm perceived as a top candidate, I should have my chance to have my piece. And so here with these three candidates, we should allow the Democratic voters to be able to support whoever they want in the knowledge, hopefully, that whoever does get that nomination will be the strongest candidate. So we have the, the problems, right? Yeah. And so can we go on the solution in this particular uh, situation? Um, sure. So, yeah. so, so like, how, how would ranked choice voting work so with that, these three candidates? So, uh, we'll, 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 we have a video that we'll bring up in a little while. I don't want okay. to get to, I don't want to get to that now, but let, this is, it. that's right. <laughs> but, but we'll it'll explain how what might happen in this example. So, again, let's say you've gone and uh, you really like Jay Gonzalez, but you also like Bob Massey too. In our current election system, on primary day, if you're going to vote in the Democratic primary, you can only vote for your top choice. But you, you have no guarantee that, uh, that Jay Gonzalez will be the one who's going to win. In fact, he may be the least popular of the three candidates. If you don't get a chance to express that preference for Bob Massey as your second choice, it could be that Seti Warren, and again, these are all good candidates here, so no disparagement to any of them. But you as the voter lose a chance to express, again, to impact what the eventual result is. And again, if your goal is to have the, the best candidate for your party in the case of a primary. And so, so the idea here is that with the ranked choice system, and we'll get to the nitty gritty in a little bit, that you would be able to go in and say, hey, I like Jake Gonzalez first, but I'm gonna tell people that I, Bob Massey is my second choice, and they actually put that on the ballot. Yep. First choice, second choice. Second choice. So in this case, if Jay Gonzalez was the least favored of the three candidates, your second choice would then go into play. I exactly, so the mechanics of ranked choice voting, and we have a great video that will go th to show how this works, is that if, if no candidate gets a majority of the vote in that, in that first, uh, first round, the candidate who is in last place gets dropped, and you essentially have what's known as an instant runoff. The, can the people who voted for that last place candidate, you'll look to their ballots and say who was their second choice. And those second choices get added to the first choices in the first round. And you do that until you get a majority of the vote. So here you'd only require two rounds because there are only three candidates. Mm -hmm. But if there were five candidates, you might have additional rounds until you had somebody um, who had a majority of, of the vote. And for the Republican Party for the presidential election, there were, what, 15 major candidates mm -hmm. in the primary? E e exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Yeah, and in some of the analysis that was done, has been, there were some studies done, some polls that were done and whatnot, and it's, uh, it's not clear, you know, a lot of those, you know, during the Republican primary, uh, Donald Trump won a lot of those uh, primary states uh, without a majority of the vote. Um, so a couple polls I'm aware of, one on the Super Tuesday states, suggested that, um, yeah, things would have gone quite differently in a ranked choice system um, where the, major the preferences of the majority of the voters were properly accounted for. And another study that was done, I think, on the entire primary or a good chunk of it, um, this was done by Fair Vote and University of Maryland, found that actually uh, Ted Cruz would have likely come out on top, you know. These, are, these were studies with you know, limited sample size and whatnot done, I think, during the time of the election. So the dynamics were still being shaped by the campaigns and whatnot. But what is very clear is that um, the Republican field was very fragmented. There was a lot of vote splitting. It affects you know, the can not only the candidates themselves, it affects voters' perceptions of who is capable of winning when they see a few primaries and they see you know, some of the candidates you know, continuously splitting the vote with each other. Right. It, it's not to say it, it, we wouldn't know unless we really ran the election again, but there's right. strong evidence that things might have gone quite differently. Hmm. Yeah. So what I'd like to offer uh, is um, to offer a couple of examples of recent races here in Massachusetts where uh, we've had candidates who've won elections or might be in a position of winning an election without majority support. So if we could actually bring up slide number eight, please. And for the folks here in Fitchburg, this will be actually be a familiar yep, yep. race. Mm -hmm. Our new so, Senator Dean Tran. Right, so yep. this was the, the election that happened a month and a half ago uh, here in, in this district. And as you 
as you can see, Dean Tran, under our first past the post system, mm -hmm. won the election, had the, the most votes in that election, but with less than 50% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Less than a majority vote. Less than the majority of the vote. And we have here, if you look at the, the bottom two candidates here, uh, Claire Frida and Charlene Di, Di Calagero, between the two of them, they had all, over 11% of the vote, which is not insubstantial. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty significant amount of the vote. So mm -hmm. the people who voted for those uh, two candidates there, the Independent and the Green Rainbow candidate, the question is, who would they have supported? Who did the majority of this district really support. Now, it may indeed have been Dean Tran. I mean, there's nothing to su suggest that everyone uh, would have voted for, uh, for Sushal or Zephyr. But we don't know. Right. And who we, rep who we have represented us in our legislatures, in, in, in the governor's offices, in the, in the federal government, um, it can it really impact policy. And so, again, nothing against Dean Tran, but the, the district, I think, would be better served if you knew that that candidate had majority support. Now, and even along those same lines, you know, when you went to go vote for one of the four candidates, you were worried about the spoiler. Mm -hmm. You were worried saying, look, I really like, I really like Charlene DeCalagero, but she's never going to win. So I'm not going to vote for that because then if I vote for her, then, then Sue Shalvo Zephyr is definitely going to get in. So I got to make sure to vote for Dean Tran or whatever, whatever right. other combination that a voter might have. But in the ranked choice voting system, you wouldn't have that worry. You could vote for Charlene de Calagero, and your second choice, you could vote for Dean Tran. Right. Yeah, right. it's a really good point. And it makes it, you know, much easier for the voter because they don't have to worry about all these strategic issues. Hmm. You know, your first important point with ranked choice voting is uh, there's no penalty for ranking the whole ballot. You're your subsequent choices never hurt your higher choices. So as a voter, you don't have to think about, you know, what if other people vote this way or this person doesn't have enough support. You just honestly you go there and rank the candidates in the order you actually prefer them and leave the booth and you've done everything you can. You don't do. have to be voting strategic, you know, right. you don't have to think voting strategy. Right, exactly. exactly. He's not the lesser of two evils either. Right. Which is exactly. Nice. Yeah. Now, just to be even handed here, so we have this example that some of it's hell, but you aren't you uh, disparaging Dean Tran, because maybe he wouldn't have won. If okay. you could bring up the next slide, uh, slide number nine. Actually, one, one thing real quick, oh, okay. and there's another factor I think we're all aware of, like, whether it was this election here or whether it was the national presidential election. Yeah. One thing we hear a lot that really upsets voters is when uh, candidates are excluded from uh, media and debates. They don't mm. get the coverage. Mm -hmm. Like um, a lot of supporters of Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, yeah. they were like, you know, how come they don't get to go on the debate stage too? Or uh, or on Flap, how Kevin didn't uh, invite Charlene DiCalagero. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and so, yeah, I think people recognize that, you know, even if they haven't built the support yet to win, I think people are really interested in what these people with these different perspectives have to say. Um, and, you know, sure, like at the presidential level, I think the parties kind of control the, the debate system or whatever. But kind of taking some of these spoiler problems that Jim's talking about and vote splitting problems off the table, kind of also take away the excuses for excluding some of these voices from the debate yeah. that can really shape, um, you know, what the candidates have to answer to as they're running as well. Yeah. So what I wanted to do, just again, in, in the spirit of being even-handed, wanted to point out this other state Senate race that happened back, at the, uh, back in October, down a little bit further south in the state. Joe where, short sleeve. Joe, I, I remember hearing about him. Exactly. Yeah. And so you, here you have, again, you had three candidates. You had the Democrat, Paul Feeney, winning with the plurality. Um, but Joe Shortsleeve, people might recognize him from TV if you're old enough in this area, uh, with 9.9%, I mean, he voted for Donald Trump very publicly. And so... So he uh, leaned to, to the Republican side. Right. But he was an independent. He was an independent. And so, again, we don't know where his voters would have gone to, but that's where the benefit of ranked choice voting comes in. But you could think, theoretically, they might have gone to the Republican candidate. Exactly. Right. Possibly. I mean, he's a complicated guy. I mean, he was a Democrat who voted Trump. And, uh, you know, this is a district that had a very conservative Democrat, Timothy, beforehand. So this could have gone. It could have gone anyway. Way. And, and again, the, 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 I mean, I'm a firm believer. I mean, I know where my politics lie. But I, I, before any of my personal politics, it's more important to me that the people who represent us should represent their communities. Mm -hmm. And they, those communities may not think like I do. And that's, that's fine. That's, that's the, the benefit of our system. So I want to bring up the next slide I want to bring up here, again, is really, uh, really pertinent to this very area. So if you could bring up slide number 10. 
So we have oh, a congressional. The Nikki Songa seat. The, the Nikki Songa seat here. <laughs> we so have if a you, lot of good little spaces. Are you even going to go in on that one, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll just need to throw your picture up here, too, Sarah. Everybody just join. But right. So here we have a situation that the, the voters in Fitchburg and throughout the 3rd Congressional District, um, if they intend to vote in the Democratic primary, are going to be faced with a, a, a almost impossible choice amongst a whole lot of really qualified candidates. Right. This is not one person and a bunch of schmoes here. We, got, we have two sitting uh, state legislators. We have a former gubern a lieutenant gubernatorial candidate, a former United States ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief of staff to Mayor Marty Walsh. Exactly. Chief uh, of staff to Marty Meehan. Exactly. And these are all very qualified people. Yet it's possible if they, if they all make it through to the, uh, to the primary election in September, that the winner in the Democratic primary could win with, say, 15% of the vote. Yeah. In fact, I think there was a tweet the other day from Barbara Latalian's team that they're excited because she is currently in the lead with some polling they did with like 12 or 14 percent. Mm. And so to Jim's point, we should be really excited about this big field here. Uh, but the thing, one of the things keeping us from getting excited about it is, you know, our goal in the democracy is to, you know, understand what the will of the majority is. And this is more like a gambling table. Like right. you can, you, you're not going to, you know, you can try to vote for someone and think what the impact's going to be, but it's, uh, it's, to put that together, you're not going to get a result that basically aggregates what the majority preference of the voter are. And what a is. lot of the voters are going to do is they're going to watch the media and look at the polls and go, okay, who's the who's the top candidates? Okay, I want to make oh, I don't want to, I may want to make sure this this guy he's not going to win, so I want to make sure I vote for this person. And I don't really like this person as much as that person. So it's a, you're you're doing vote this yeah. strategic yeah. voting, which shouldn't be right. on the voter. And, and with but. the thresholds that low, with the ability to win this election with what, 12, what is it here, 12 percent? I mean, it could be less than 10 percent with <laughs> 12 candidates, right. When the threshold's that low, the dynamics of running change. So instead of appealing to the majority of the voters here in, what is it, CD8? Three. CD3, sorry. Um, you can figure out, well, you know, if I focus in on just the people in, you know, this town or, mm -hmm. or these two towns, or if I focus on this demographic and really turn them out and really get them excited, that'll put me over the top because Everybody else mm -hmm. is going to split the rest of that. Or way. you can uh, negative campaign against your top mm -hmm. other candidates and knock, try to knock them out right. against the voters. So it really encourages a negative campaigning. It, yeah. Exactly right. And so, again, this, is, this race is primed for people saying, hey, I like three or four of the people. I haven't met any of them. I, 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 mean, I live in the 3rd Congressional District as well. And I look forward to hearing more about all these people. I have no opinion yet. And the idea of saying, I'm going to have to figure out one out of these 12 is going to be really hard because yeah, most yeah. likely I'm going to hear from a bunch of them and say, I like a bunch of them. And how do I pick and what's the, what will be the basis of that choice other than eeny, meeny, miny, mo? This is probably the best example yes. of uh, being able to rank your vote. It shows you how random it ultimately could be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly right. So again, one more example, just again, for even handedness, if we go to slide 11, uh, it's not just the Democrats who have an interesting race. Oh, uh, yes, we from, have uh, this against Elizabeth Warren. Against Elizabeth Warren. And so here you have three candidates uh, who are announced for the Republican uh, uh, nomination for the U.S. Senate race this year against Elizabeth Warren. And this is a classic vote splitting situation in the making because mm. we have a Representative Deal over here who is considered to be the, the most right wing of the candidates. And then you have two candidates. Uh, both well regarded, mind you, who are represent again called the more moderate ring of the of the Republican Party. I mean, so it, they would be spl splitting the vote, and then exactly. Deal would win. Exactly, and again, if you are a Republican partisan and you'd like to see a Republican in that Senate seat, presumably you want the strongest candidate to win. Mm -hmm. And in that scenario, if if Kingston and Lindstrom were to get collectively sixty percent of the vote, but Deal wins with forty. Have the Republicans in that case nominated their strongest candidate? Arguably, I'd say no, they have not. Mm -hmm. If that's yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, if that's the case. And this this uh, particular election also illustrates something else we were talking about earlier about discouraging candidates from running. So in this case, you're discouraging one of the two on the left to run. Well, yes, not only that, but there was a piece I think in the Globe a couple months back about uh, Kingston's campaign was uh, borderline in danger of violating some campaign laws because they were 
somewhat, uh, they were they were strongly uh, encouraging Beth Lindstrom's camp, Beth Lindstrom to drop out of the race, and there may have been some other incentives involved um, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, just another example of how our polarity system, you know, leads people who support one candidate or the other to try to narrow the field. Yep. Yeah. So. What else can we tell you? <laughs> we're we're, we're going to go out of state in a moment here. So yeah, let me just to wrap up then, yeah. Jim. Um, yes, yeah, so not wrap up completely, but you know we've looked. You've shown us a lot of great examples here, and so I guess to summarize them a little bit, you know these are problems that when there's just two candidates running, we don't have these problems of spoiler effect. We don't have these problems of vote splitting. We don't have the problem of someone winning without a majority mandate because there's only, only two. two people running. The problem we have when there's only two people running is you don't have a lot of choices. You got two choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, so the fact that as soon as you introduce a third candidate, let alone a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a twelfth, or whatever, our, our elections just system just starts to break down. Mm -hmm. and you, it, it starts to exhibit all the problems that Jim is walking us through. Um, and this is a real, this is a real problem. This is, uh, we, we lose the majority mandate, which really alters the democratic character of our elections. It introduces vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about opportunities for manipulating elections and whatnot. Well, this is another way that elections can be uh, intentionally or inadvertently manipulated. I mean, in, inadvertently manipulated when people just run because they have something to, to offer and they run and you see how that can affect the field in ways that aren't fair to the, the candidates. But there are cases where uh, political organizations have actually tried to manipulate this feature as well. I think one of the classic examples was I think uh, some Arizona Republicans were uh, putting some homeless people on the Green Party ticket <laughs> in order because it was just mathematically if you have uh, you know if you have t a Democrat and a Republican running and you get a, a Green, Green any Party green in there there's going to be a few Democrats that say you know I want to send a message I'm going to vote for the, the Green or whatever so that's or a similar thing probably with Republicans and Libertarians. If you run someone on the Libertarian, it might take away from the Republican. Sure. Well, that's absolutely true, and that has happened. Jim will cue something up there. And Arizona, back to Arizona again, yeah. they recently passed a law specifically with the goal of making it harder for Libertarian candidates to make it on the ballot because they were beginning to suffer, the Republican Party of Arizona was beginning to suffer from vote splitting. Now, I'm talking about a couple of Republican examples here. The Republicans are by no means alone <laughs> in doing these kinds of things yeah. or having this type of reaction. This to is a really a nonpartisan issue. It right. really is yeah. a nonpartisan issue. Yes, yeah. exactly. All right, great. So, how about we take a quick break, yep. and then we'll come back and uh, we'll continue our, our discussion on ranked choice voting. Welcome to FATV, Fitchburg Access Television. Each week we take pride in providing some of the best public access television programs in New England. From FATV live sporting events, city meetings, and school functions, to weekly shows such as Barbara and You, Inside and Discussing Fitchburg, Sports Weekly, Weekly Wellness, and Our City. Our dedicated staff of industry professionals and hard-working volunteers is here each week working behind the scenes, making it all happen. Besides on-air, our programming is also shown live online, where you can see our shows in beautiful high definition. You can also search through our archive of past shows and watch anytime at your leisure. But did you know you can also be part of the action? Become a member of FATV and you gain access to all the equipment, studio space, and classes that FATV has to offer. You can create your own show, volunteer for exciting live events in our studio, or all around the city in our high quality mobile broadcast truck. The possibilities are endless. For a small fee, you can become an individual member, or for a little more, you and a group of friends can become part of a rising trend in the future of television. From sports shows to news shows, 
civic events, and talk shows. You can be in the driver's seat by directing and even starring in your own production. Also, students are free. FATV staff can assist you by getting your new show up and running with professional industry standard equipment, TV studio time, and private editing suites. All you need are friends to help out, and before you know it, you will be on the air. So if you have a great idea for a TV show and want to share it with the world, stop by 175 Kimball Street, Fitchburg for a free tour of our facility. You can also contact us at 978-343-0834 or email us at info at FATV.org. Fitchburg Access Television, working together for a stronger community. Welcome back to DFN on FATV, our discussion on ranked choice voting. We are going to cut to a comment from our Facebook audience. We have Trisha Flay Flayhive who asks, does the ranked choice voting system exist su su successfully today anywhere in the world? The, the answer to that is yes. I'll, I'll take the domestic side and, and Nathan here will take the, the global side. Uh, ranked choice voting has been used um, in the United States in a number of jurisdictions for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, mostly in municipalities. So there are a number of cities in California, San Francisco, Oakland, a couple others have been using ranked choice voting to elect their mayors and city councils and such for a number the of years. The city of Cambridge, Massachusetts has been doing it since 1942? Yeah, Cambridge uses it to elect its city council. Uh, there are, I mean, right uh, recently the city of Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, uh, will be um, their ranked choice system was just approved by their court system uh, over the objections of their city council. They didn't want to implement it, but the court said the people wanted it, and it's going to be used for the first time this year. There's a similar issue in the state of Maine? State of Maine, we'll, we'll talk about Maine in a little bit, but yeah, that's a, it's a slightly different issue in, in Maine. Um, but one of the interesting examples of ranked choice voting having been used very successfully uh, in this country is in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wish we had ways to get Super Bowl tickets uh, to go there and to really examine it in person, but <laughs> be that as it may. Uh, but the, the, both Minneapolis and St. Paul had their um, municipal elections this past November. And where they elected um, mayors and city council and such. So up here on the screen here, uh, we bring up this is our slide 18. I'll show you what people would a voter would have seen had they gone into the ballot. Now this is actually a ballot from uh, four uh, four years ago, 2013. This is for mayor. But this is for mayor. And so the a, a person going into a ballot booth would be able to look at the list of candidates for mayor. A lot of people ran for mayor. A lot of people back in 2013, wow. and even more so this year, uh, this past year in 2017. Mm. And the individual voter would get a chance to actually select a first choice, and if they felt they had a second preference, they could list that second preference in the second column and a third choice uh, in the third column. Mm -hmm. And that would that is all that the voter has to do. It's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. so, you, so if I want Stephanie Woodruff first, but then John Leslie Hartwing, number two, and then Betsy Hodges, number three, and the statistically, yeah. one of your top candidates is probably yeah. going to be elected. Yeah, exact, exactly right. Um, so what I'd like to do now, having shown people the, the, this ballot, is actually bring up a video that was produced by the city of Minneapolis to actually show how this process works sort of mechanically. You vote, what happens then? So if we could bring up the video to, uh, to show our folks, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Minneapolis, because we've got uh, some good stories from All there. right, let's cue the video. It's called ranked choice voting. Here's an example of how it works. All of the candidates will be listed on the ballot in three columns. Make your first choice vote in column one by filling in the oval of the candidate you'd most like to win. Vote for your second choice in column two and make your third choice in column three. That's all there is to it. Now let's see how the votes are counted. Let's say there are four candidates running for mayor. Asha, Zach, Omar, and Lucy. Once the polls close, we count all the first choice votes first. To be elected mayor, a candidate needs more than half the votes. In this example, Asha has more than half of the votes, so she's declared the winner. However, if no candidate gets more than half the votes, we start eliminating candidates and counting the next choices of those who voted. In this example, Zach is the candidate with the smallest number of first choice votes, so he is cut. 
We use the second choice votes on Zach's ballots and count those voters' second choices instead. If one of the remaining candidates now has more than half of the total votes, that candidate is declared the winner. If not, the next lowest candidate, Lucy, is eliminated. Her votes are now counted for the next choice on the ballot. Some of Lucy's votes went to Zach, who was already eliminated, so those new votes for Zach instead count for those voters' third choice candidate. We are now down to two candidates, and Omar clearly has more than half of the votes. That makes him the winner. That's how ranked choice voting works. So now you've seen how this process works. Now, one of the really nifty things that we've learned in Minneapolis is that the people in Minneapolis themselves really like this system. Uh, they've gone through a couple of a... Uh, of, uh, uh, this was instituted election. in like 2009 yeah, in so Minneapolis? They've gone, yeah, gone through a couple of election uh, cycles in Minneapolis. And what they have found is that they've seen an uptick in voter participation. They've, they, there are actually more people voting now than there had been before ranked choice voting came into play. It was like a play. 57% turnout in the past mayoral election, it was is that about, right? It was about or 43. Municipal election? Uh, 43 percent. 43 percent. In an off-cycle election. That's still, that's still it very crazy. high. It was, it was a 20-year high. They were running out of ballots. They had to photocopy ballots at the polling stations. Wow. Yeah, wow. it was a really great turnout. Now, so, considering Fitchburg and Lemonster have like 20 to 24 percent turnout, yeah. Exactly right. And so with the implementation of ranked choice voting, using the system where you get to rank the candidates and where you assure yourself of a candidate that wins with a majority support, the people in the Twin Cities have embraced it. Same issue in St. Paul right next door uh, in Minnesota. That they, they saw a similar uptick in their voter participation, which I think bodes well. Um, for this system, but also is indicative of how ranked choice voting has been embraced uh, in these municipalities around the country um, and, and around the world. So, uh, so where, where else have they been using ranked choice voting? Well, on, oh, back, oh, on this on this oh, note, I mean, we have so many candidates yeah, running yeah, yeah. for mayor, and so with more voter with more participation by candidates, it would you know yeah. you would think that there would be more participation by the voters themselves. Exactly right. Well, that's been the theory, and because you know ranked choice voting in these municipal elections, I think you know the Bay Area has probably been doing it since the early to mid two thousands. Minneapolis, their first mayor was in twenty thirteen, so it's interesting in the the usage in the U.S. to see how it's evolving. Mm. And, um, you know, just some anecdotes. I mean, in 2013, the first time they used it, uh, Minneapolis elected their second female mayor in, in their history. Um, you know, an impressive candidate, an impressive uh, mayor in many ways, did some pretty impressive things like pass a $15 minimum wage. Now, uh, fast forward to 2017. Um, you know, some good things going on there in Minneapolis. Also, some big issues the community wants to see get resolved, like police community relations and other things. So they get a wide field of candidates talking about the issues. Uh, included, you know, three or four people from, it was three or more people from the Democratic Party, including the seated mayor. Um, there was a former president of the NAACP who was running. There was a Republican who was running. There were a number of other parties, uh, some amusing ones. Uh, uh, the Jack Sparrow Pirate Party. There was the Rainbows and Unicorns <laughs> Party. My favorite was the Ideas Party. They didn't really play a huge role. But there was a very competitive race with really constructive discussion of the issues. And it resulted in the you know fairly accomplished incumbent being unseated by a majority mandate. And uh, so that was one interesting feature. Over across in St. Paul, they elected their first African American mayor with over with in with a with a majority vote. Majority vote, mm -hmm. even in first choice votes, he won. Uh, so, so that was uh, you know some interesting results there as well. And to Jim's point, very popular. I think the the, the polls that were done afterwards, the exit polls, were something like 83 percent of Minneapolis voters want to retain ranked choice voting as the way they, they vote. So they've experienced it for two elections, mm -hmm. they've seen the difference, and they've embraced it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, and the, the learning curve obviously wasn't, wasn't a problem, and if they've only done it for two elections and people are already, they're into it, so that's great. Yeah, now it doesn't happen without voter education. You saw the nice video there that we queued up. That was produced by the city of Minneapolis. They spent mm -hmm. money and time and effort educating the public about what they were getting into. Uh, training their, their voting staff and their town clerks so that they could efficiently and effectively you know, execute a ranked choice election. But it's very doable. And you know, as Sam was saying, down in Cambridge, they'll tell you, you know, 
any town can do this if they put their mind to it. And yep. They've been doing it for 70 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So does ranked choice voting eliminate the need for primary elections? It certainly could. I mean, I think there's a cultural issue that we have both from a party perspective and a voting public perspective about the use of primaries. Uh, I, th I think you'd have a hard time getting people go go cold turkey. Uh, but you certainly could eliminate the costs of primary elections, which, I mean, maybe at a state statewide level, uh, there wouldn't be enough um, interest in doing that, but perhaps at a city level. Right, because at a mm -hmm. municipal level, let's say we have, uh, you know, for example, in, in Fitchburg, for mayor, you can only have two candidates running. So if a third candidate runs, then we need an entire citywide preliminary election to get to, to, to wean that down to yeah. two candidates. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a $20,000 approximate wow. cost. And, and where we have, what, 7% turnout maybe for the entire city. This system could eliminate that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So it's a we, it, you know, and what we're looking at so, some of the, the our voter choice Massachusetts, the plan we're promoting for Massachusetts would uh, allow towns to adopt ranked choice voting and eliminate those preliminaries with massive cost savings. The other thing you alluded to, which the cost savings are very important. This hits municipalities really hard. You can read about it in this cycle. There's an article about Quincy. You got hit with it, and it was very expensive. And like you say, the turnout's low, but that low turnout ten, turns out to be a really big problem, too, because um, you know, it, with these preliminary final formats, you, you get you know seven, ten, whatever in the preliminary. You often get low turnout in the final. Some, vo you know, don't vote in the preliminary because they, it's not final. What's the point? Some, some get angry. Their candidate gets eliminated in the preliminary and don't go out and vote. And it turns out this uh, not only is it expensive. Um, it also suffers greatly from the type of vote splitting that Jim has been walking us through tonight. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, it turns out, in studies they've done in the Bay Area and elsewhere, is that the demographics of voters who turn out for these preliminaries is not necessarily broadly reflective of the electorate as you know as a whole. It turns out to the general. It turns out to the general. Right. They tend to be, uh, you know, older, whiter, and wealthier. Now. They're people too. Of course, their vote is important. But you know, in these elections, we really want them to maximize the turnout of voters and really get a, a broad, representative cross section of voters. So that uh, the type of turnout, you know, having multiple elections that are not equally convenient for all people, um, you know, has an impact on who gets elected. Right. I'd just like to note you you mentioned how we have something in the in the Senate and the House, and we, we currently have Senate Bill H two eight nine seven, an act providing a local option for ranked choice voting in municipal elections, and the House Bill H three seven seven, an act to promote better better voting practices. These are currently in the Joint Committee on Election Laws. Just moved there yesterday. Yes. So if you're if you're interested in ranked choice voting, you can contact your representative or your senator to let them know what how you feel. Yeah. Now, now your rep is is it Stephen Hay or Stephen Hay for um, Fitchburg? It's Natalie Higgins in Lemonster, and we have Senator Dean Tran for both Fitchburg and Lemonster. Right. Gotcha. Now Jen Benson in over in Lun part of Lunenburg and Acton, she's in she's endorsed or she's a co-sponsor of this bill. Oh yeah. Um, Jamie Eldridge in Acton. Yep. Jamie Eldridge in Acton. Uh, uh, is it Senator Gobi? Uh, Good. Senator Gobi is the chair for the uh, Senate. Um, um, committee on Election Laws. And also promisingly a co-sponsor of the bill, I believe. So yeah. yes, definitely let them know that you support that. Um, it could really make a difference for municipalities. Yeah, I mean, it's really, we have these bills here um, that are um, really an opportunity for us to uh, to push forward toward, uh, toward ranked choice voting. Now, ranked choice voting bills have been presented before the legislature for many years. and. One of the things we are hoping to do here, both as Voter Choice Massachusetts and just as citizens, is to take uh, the growth in ranked choice voting, and we talked about the municipalities that have been using it around the country for a number of years, and you add on top of that the, uh, the uh, adoption of ranked choice voting up in Maine mm. uh, back in 2016 by a, a ballot measure up there, and we are beginning to see an opportunity um, to, to ride a wave here. I mean, people are becoming more familiar with the idea. People are are disenchanted with the the lesser of two evils argument. Uh, again, they, they they see the problems in the voting system caused by gerrymandering, and I think people are beginning to see that they, we can make a change. That we don't have to necessarily live with the system we have. And so, certainly adopting on a statewide basis in Maine 
is a harder push than uh, working toward local options so that the folks in Fitchburg can do it for their and municipal have elections. Have the option to, to adopt right. this if they so choose. Right. But we're working um, for all of this in the right. sense that, and, and there is. A, there is a wave of interest. I mean, more and more people are learning what this is about, and that's part of our job here. Yep, there was a uh, there was a hearing in October where the, the I heard the, the it was packed, full of uh, proponents. One of the great things, so both Nathan and I were um, were at the hearing, but one of the great things that happened at that hearing was that the chair of the of the committee uh, invited people um, who were there to support these ranked choice voting bills just to stand up and say where they were from in the state. Now. Needless to say, there were a couple people there from Boston and Cambridge, but it was remarkable that at this hearing in at the State House, there were people from all over the state. And I mean, there were people from the Berkshires, people from the uh, from the center part of the state, from people the northeast, all around Massachusetts, all around. and to show how broadly the interest in ranked choice voting um, is. It's mm -hmm. not just again all those. Um, the crunchy folks from Cambridge who do their own ranked choice system. <laughs> that, it, it's a broad coalition of folks uh, that broad both geographically but broad um, politically as well. Yeah, I have a uh, quote from the Lowell son of Jamie Eldridge who said, it's critical to the future health of our democracy that we encourage higher voter turnout and that our diversity is reflected in our elected institutions. That was uh, on their report. From the yeah, hearing, it, exactly. well spoken. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. So, I mean, that's what we're working toward here. Um, I mean, you mentioned Maine. I mean, the, what happened up in Maine was really a, a watershed moment for the for the uh, for the people of Maine to actually go into the ballot box and say, "We want to make this change." And, and just to be clear, this change was ranked choice voting statewide, all state and federal offices, uh, primary and general elections. So basically, everything but the presidential election in Maine. Uh, at the statewide level, would use ranked choice voting. Not necessarily no. municipal um, op office no, voting no, unless no, they Portland, so adopted. Exactly, Portland had already adopted it, so Portland had been. But you got it exactly right, Sam. Yeah. Right, okay. exactly right. So, what's happening? You alluded to this earlier. We ha there's a very interesting case up in Maine right now because th there's a portion of the Maine Constitution that explicitly uses the word plurality, mm -hmm. and there were uh, opponents of ranked choice voting. Who, oh, who, real quick, let's talk about what plurality is, big word there. So plurality, we'll contrast plurality with majority. So majority means 50% plus one vote. That's a majority of votes in an election. And that's what we, you know, you typically associate with democracy. That's what we want as a democracy is we want to fill positions with a majority mandate. A plurality is just most votes of the candidates. Right, exactly. I, again, it's the first past the post system. It's mm -hmm. Just whoever has the most, the, the, the... Whoever of all the candidates has the most votes. Exactly. Yeah. More so votes it, than anybody a, else, yeah. Which exactly. could be 12% if you got 12 candidates running for a particular office. Like in the, the third congressional district. Like in the third <laughs> yeah. congressional yeah. district, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So up in Maine, there was this, uh, this uh, the, the word plurality shows up in the, in the Maine Constitution, which would have inhibited the use of ranked choice voting in the general elections for some of these offices. Not all the offices in the bill. So ranked choice voting, despite this issue with the Constitution, was going to apply to a bunch of these races up in Maine. Uh, the Maine legislature, however, they're in their wisdom, "Quote unquote," um, passed a bill last uh, last November that was tantamount to repealing ranked choice voting. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that was essentially the, the practical effect. Despite the fact that the people of Maine had uh, had voted for it, as, yeah, as opposed to the alternative of updating and clarifying the Maine Constitution on this matter, they chose instead to get rid of what the voters asked for. Use yeah. it to their advantage, to. Get right, rid of you, the you exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. And so, what, what's happening right now? They're on the tail end of the effort. There's an effort up in Maine called the, the People's Veto, and they're trying to to get enough signatures, essentially, to veto the legislature's action. Uh -huh. And wow. if they're successful, it's going to be it'll be make it for a fascinating situation up in Maine right. this June, because this June they'll have their next statewide elections, which will be their their state primaries for the federal offices and whatever offices are up for election in, in 2018. And so if the people's veto is successful, on the ballot in Maine in June will be a question whether or not to keep ranked choice voting while at the same time people will be using ranked, ranked choice, choice voting, voting <laughs> to, uh, to determine the, the nominees of the various parties for the uh, U.S. Senate uh, or uh, US, uh, the uh, members of Congress, uh, gubernatorial, et cetera. And so it's going to be a fascinating uh, yeah. scene up in Maine if, uh, if they're able to get the, uh, the signatures 
that process is coming to an end. They have like another week to, to finish up. Yep. Um, exciting time. It is very exciting. <laughs> is it looking good yes. for the people's veto? Well, not, not sure. It, it, we think so. We think so. But uh, just to, so this is just this main thing is just a huge deal. First of all, this is like this is informing informed how we're going about ranked choice voting in Massachusetts. Yep. This, uh, when this got passed in Maine, you know, there's a group of folks that had been working on this in Massachusetts for six, seven years, including yeah. Jim, who's been doing this for a long time. When they kind of rebooted after this pass in Maine, they went from like, what, a handful, five, yeah. seven activists, to now we've got 2,000 people signed up to volunteer. Wow. Probably a couple hundred of those are active at this time. And we've gone from like a list of 250 supporters to we're closing in on, we're over 8,000, you know, and, and moving pretty quickly. For Voter Choice MA. For Voter Choice yeah. Massachusetts, that's right. So this, you know, Maine was the first one in the U.S. and they show that this is a reform that can be adopted state by state. And you can run a state campaign for something that's pretty impactful, pretty big positive change, but you can make it happen in your state and then the next state and the next state. And before we, They'll run out of time. I want to answer Ms. Flahive's question about where else in the world real quick. Go for it. So Maine is the first place in the U.S., and that gave us a lot of momentum. Statewide. First place. Statewide. statewide. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of hope. Um, around the world, so a lot of the problems Jim walked us through tonight, uh, m most of the world's democracy, advanced democracies don't suffer from these problems nearly as badly, or they're either non-existent or severely mitigated, because uh, most of the world's advanced democracies use some form of proportional representation. And we won't get into the details of that tonight, but you'd, you don't have the same degree of vote splitting, you don't have the same degree of, um, you don't have spoiler effect, basically. Mm -hmm. There's many different parties, like in, in Europe yep. and Canada, they have many parties besides Republican, Democrat. Exactly. It's a multi-party systems. And the reason they have multi-party systems is not just because they say, hey, let's have more parties. It's because they also have a way of voting and tabulating votes that supports having more parties. Mm -hmm. Now, the question about where else is this used? So uh, Ireland and Australia have used ranked choice voting extensively for the last hundred years. I think uh, Australia was 1916 and uh, I think Ireland started I think a similar time frame. Yeah. I can't remember exactly but right. So they've had a little bit of practice with it. Mm. Uh, a lot of practice with it and they that's just how they vote. They wouldn't you know they, they, they if you ask a person in Ireland, if you put one of our ballots in front of them, they'd be like, or Australia, they'd be like, what's wrong here? How come I can only, you know? I can only vote for one. one. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and it's been very successful there. Um, but you, you might say, well, why just Australia and, and Ireland? Um, well, the main reason is the other countries have solved the same problems with a different different system, basically. Well, right. uh, Canada, Canada's, um, didn't Canada's pri primary process use yes. a ranked choice so voting? I, I'm glad you yeah, brought... Yeah, their party, their party nomination process. Party yeah. nomination. Mm -hmm. The party nomination. So the United, so here we are, you know, this ranked choice voting would be a major upgrade for the United States. And we're kind of in a small handful of countries that are kind of, it'd be kind of like if we were still using, you know, horse and carriage and the rest of the world's using trains and cars, you know, that's kind of, we're, it's us, it's the UK and Canada. Now the UK and Canada use it in party, use ranked choice voting in party elections. Right. In Canada, um, right now there's a, a, a pretty large number of people who are a little miffed with Trudeau because Justin he Trudeau. ran on a, Justin Trudeau ran on a platform. He's a very popular leader mm -hmm. overall, but they're a little upset because We he love ran. him in the United States. We do. Yeah, we, love him. <laughs> we wish we could afford him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's got great abs and all that. But, uh, he, he hugs panda bears. Oh. He hugs panda bears. Yeah. But he ran on a platform of electoral reform, which was going to include uh, some major changes, possibly proportional representation. You know, uh, and he's kind of walking back on that. He's actually yeah. walking back from proportional, saying he's, he would like rank choice, but not doing anything. And people are a little upset. I say this because Canada, UK, US, we are a handful of countries that still have this plurality system. Mm -hmm. New Zealand had it. They changed their their voting system in um, 1996 and adopted a similar uh, proportional system like Germany's. Um, but so we're in a very small minority of advanced democracies now who still have this problem and Canada is not going to be there for long because they're going to get this done before too long and we'd like to get this done here right, too. Right. Now, and I'll offer one more example to answer our, the, the, the viewer's question about has it been used in other places. In one of the most important places, one of the most famous places that ranked choice voting is used, and we all know about it or will know about it over the next month and a half, 
is for Best Picture in the Oscars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, so for those of you who are Oscar fans, if you whether or not you like the pictures that they chose for Best Picture this year, when the Best Picture is chosen, and presumably they'll pick the right name out of the hat this year, <laughs> that the, the Best Picture will have been chosen by ranked choice voting. Mm. And that's, again, I'm sure people who have their favorite movies could say, yeah, I like this movie first, but I like that movie second. And they're, they're going to implement that for the, for the Oscars and, and have for like, a number of years. I feel like everyone has done an online poll that says, you know, what's your first, how do you feel about these things? First, put them in first, second, third, you know, you drag it. First choice, second Priorities. choice, third choice. Everyone has used a form of this in, in different ways. It, exactly, sure. exactly right. Yeah, and it's something we're certainly familiar with in everyday life. Now, I think our clock is running down here. We have four yeah. minutes. We have That's four right. minutes. And I think you're going to have to have us back to talk more about the local stuff. If you want to talk about council elections and all that fun stuff we didn't have a chance to get to today. Sounds good. Mm. Can we put in some plugs for how people can get involved with uh, Voter Choice Massachusetts? Certainly. Do we have any slides or do we just want to verbally? No, we're going to we're gonna have to tell you, tell you about that. We um, probably should have brought that up. But, uh, certainly, the, the, the easiest way that people can learn about Voter Choice Massachusetts and learn about more about Ranked Choice Voting is to go to our website, which is not uh, uh, surprisingly VoterChoiceMA.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's the first piece, place people can go. VoterChoiceMA.org. Exactly right. Now again, if you are more of the Facebook generation, I'm, my kids are too young, not so much because they think Facebook is for the old fogies like me, but if you're, <laughs> oh, if, no. if, if you're a, a Facebook person, again, not so unsurprisingly, facebook.com slash voter choice MA. Yeah. And, and we have a lot of our events posted on both the website and the Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Please go like our Facebook page, invite your friends to come review some of the materials there and also like the page. That's a big help, but also when you go to the website, you can uh, go in, there's a section where you can get involved. Sign up for email alerts. Exactly. We're trying to get people in every town and city in Massachusetts involved. There's regular events. There's regular events in Boston. There's regular, there's, there's, yeah. they're gonna, you're going to be at the Lunenburg Democratic Town Committee uh, soon. Yep. They, you know, they, yeah. there's all sorts of events. There was just a, a, a regional one in Worcester. Yeah. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an event around you if you want to learn yeah, more. Nathan here is the star of our central Massachusetts region here. Uh, so come and see his handsome face. He's, I mean, he's great. Um, <laughs> and, but we really want to engage people, again, across, across the state, geographically, across the political spectrum. So you don't have to say, oh, I, I'm... I'm a libertarian. What do they have for me? No, we really want people. You're a nonpartisan organization. Nonpartisan organization. Yep. And the reform is nonpartisan. I mean, we went yep. through the examples. It doesn't help just Democrats. It doesn't just help Republicans. At the end of the day, if we all get a chance to express our preferences, I'd like to think our representatives in, uh, in government will actually hear what those preferences are and react accordingly. Yep. And, the, and the voters themselves will feel like they were a part of, the pro of, of selecting the winner. Either, yes, oh yes, he was my second choice. As, as, as opposed to, I didn't vote for that person. Exactly That's right. Good point. Exactly right. Absolutely. So what else can we tell you in our this last, last any, minute? Any, any other last questions, Kelly? Ooh. We have one minute. One minute. This will be the speed. Speed, <laughs> speed round. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I think you covered them. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have one last thing, which again, we'll have to talk about uh, again, but one of the benefits that we didn't get to talk about is the fact that it, uh, ranked choice voting promotes positive campaigning. You alluded to it. Positive uh, campaigning, uh, yeah, yeah, as opposed to right. a smear, oh, yeah, benefiting right. a smear campaign. Mm. That's right, ranked choice voting, uh, again, this is the positive thing to think of it. It, 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 there's, a, there's an absolute incentive for candidates to, po to campaign for what they want as opposed to knock people down. And who, who out there in the electorate doesn't want to see positive campaigns as opposed to the mudslinging that we're all too familiar with it's true. throughout Absolutely. our election yeah. process? We don't want to turn people off. We want to, we want to engage people yeah, in a base, positive direction. Exactly. And the reason for that is the candidates are incented to go for those second and third choice votes of the voters. So if you know someone's going to vote for your opponent, you you still want them to vote you next. Yeah, all right, <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jim Henderson and Nathan Lockwood from Voter Choice MA. If you want to learn more about that, go to voterchoicema.org and follow them on Facebook. This is Discussing Fitchburg Now on FATV. Thanks so much for watching. Yeah, right, thanks, thank you. guys. Thank you. This is great. Yeah, definitely. Awesome.